All right, so today we are speaking about Parashat Tzav, which is the second portion in uh, Vaikra, in Leviticus. And it's all about the sacrifices. It is uh, Leviticus 6 to 8, 6 verse 8 to 8 verse 36. And uh, just a brief idea what this is about is uh, it's as last week. It's again about the five offerings uh, from verse 8 to uh, verse 18. And it speaks about uh, this week, uh, lo- well, last week it was about Israel's contribution, Israel's bringing the sacrifices to as an act of worship to the tabernacle, to the temple. And uh, this week it is the responsibility of the priesthood dealing with the sacrifices that are discussed. So how do the priesthood that are the, in, uh, that are the facilitators of worship, how do they treat the sacrifices once Israel has brought them? And, um, and as we read this morning's portion together, it's amazing the detail that the Father builds in to our act and our facilitation of worship. It is something to think about. Um, I think uh, we, we assume that we are worshipping the Father in spirit and truth and according to His will. But I think we've got lots to learn about the detail of the protocol, what it means to worship Him. As you go on in this uh, portion, you'll find that it's all about the priesthood. How do they interact with the sacrifices? If they are in a state of contempt, if something touches a mincha, a meal offering, in verse 19, what happens to, what happens to, the, to the offering that's brought? If something that is contaminated, touches it. What happens to the, to the meal offering? Who knows? Who can think? The mincha, the meal offering, whatever it touches, that becomes set apart. It's amazing. So whatever it touches, it bec- uh, that item becomes set apart. So, so not so the sin offering and the others, then you discard of the sacrifice. But this is a different story. So, in any case, it says that the fat and the blood is not to be eaten. And um, how do the priesthood, as as um, as a what can I what's what's the right word? The priesthood is there to re- as representatives, as representatives of the Father. They sit and they eat the sacrifice, the sin offerings, the portions of what is. What is brought for them, uh, that's brought to them as what they um, receive as a representative of the Father. Between the worshipper and the Father, we have a meal together. And the priesthood eat that as representatives of the Father in the set apart place. So it's an amazing portion. I, I think the sacrifices or the korbanot, uh, that which is brought to the Father for, by reason of worship. We have a difficult time to understand that because it's so far removed from our perspective and our experience. But uh, in some day, not too far in the future, I think, the temple will be reinstated. The temple of Ezekiel will be reinstated and we will have the, the, the pleasure, we will have the... The, um, the what? The honor is the right word, thank you. The honor to see the sacrifices in action in the temple of Ezekiel, as Ezekiel 40 to 48 says. So it is a physical picture, the sacrifices, the korbanot, is a physical picture of what Yeshua accomplished for us. It's a physical, a, phys- a physical picture. <clears throat> it is a physical picture of what it means to worship the Father and bring honor to His name. So it's a beautiful act of worship and it helps the worshiper to identify with what he is doing. And now we learn by our physical things and, and we know the scripture paints a lot of pictures for us what it meant for Israel and the patriarchs to walk in the Father's presence. And from that we can gain spiritual understanding. And so the sacrifices. The physical things that happen in front of us helps us to identify with what happens in the Spirit. Okay, so... So as, we, as I was thinking about the sacrifices um, this week, I was thinking all around them, not just the sacrifices. We have discussed that many times. But um, 
the reality of bringing a sacrifice to the Father, bringing an act of worship to the Father, comes from wood. Okay? Because it needs to be burnt. It needs to, there's fire involved. And the evidence of yesterday's worship is the ashes on the altar of your heart today. So the problem is, if we are dwelling in yesterday's worship, the day before, the day before, the day before, and we don't engage in worship today, then what can happen is the ashes of previous experiences with the Father clogs up our understanding and our worship today. Because His Word is new every morning, we are supposed, as the, as the example of the temple was functioning, every morning a priest, a set-apart priest, comes and he carefully removes the ashes of the worship that was done yesterday. And what does he do with it? He treats it with respect. He takes the, the ashes to a set-apart place, to a clean place, it says, to a clean place and they bury it. So it is, it is something that we can honor as our experience with the Father and what we are learning from Him and the way that we have worshipped Him. But we cannot dwell in that. Because if we keep there, if we stay there, our relationship stagnates and it cools down. Because there's no heat in ashes. Alright, so... It is, the word is new every morning. And if, as we look at the sacrifices of last week, let's make a quick comparison. Last week, we saw that there's the, the korbanot, the five korbanot. Which are they? The ola, it is the burnt offering, the ascending offering, it is the meal offering, um, the mincha, it is a product of meal and that's brought to the altar. And uh, the shlamim, the peace offering, those are the voluntary um, offerings of last week. As we read, this is what we are bringing as just as an act of gratitude and worship and what we do um, because we love the Father and we want to worship and glorify Him, recognizing His goodness, as we said this morning, that's following us, His goodness and His mercy and His kindness. And because of this, we bring these offerings. But then there are mandatory offerings for the children of Israel. If you would omit to do something that honors the Father's name, or there is something that happens in your life that makes His name less, then you will bring a sin offering. And if there is any guilt for the asham, the guilt offering, we need to bring the sin and the guilt offering. That is mandatory. If something goes wrong in your life, it's mandatory to repair the breach, to make it right, and, and make sure that our relationship with the Father is on firm footing. All right, so what happens if we don't bring the khatat and the sin offering, uh, the, the guilt offering in our life? What happens if we fail to, in the life of Israel, what happened to them if they didn't bring these sacrifices on the long run? What was the netto effect in their lives? Separation, which led to? We saw, the, we saw the result in Miriam's life. She didn't recognize her sin. And what happened to her? Leprosy. So, this is the falling. If, if you fail to bring these sacrifices in our own lives, if we fail to repent, to confess our sin, to repent, to make right what is wrong, then eventually it leads to a cooling down of what happens on your altar. There's no more sacrifices that takes place, no more heat, no more an odor, aroma that comes from your life, and your separation from the Father, from relationship, active relationship increases. And so eventually, it ends up in a stagnant relationship. So, this is why the Father said to the children of Israel, Bring the Ola, the Mincha, and the Shlamim to me as an act of worship. And the, the peace offering is there to proclaim peace between the worshipper and our Father. The Mincha is a, a thanksgiving offering to say that the, the, the rain that you have provided... I have planted my crops and I have harvested and now I'm sitting with flour that I could present as a thanksgiving to you, as a, as a representative portion of thanksgiving to you. And the burnt offering is there to say my whole life I lay before you and I recognize I'm dependent on everything that you do for me. So those are voluntary, but if something happens in your life, uh, sin and guilt, it's mandatory. So this week though, it's not that. This week the, the order changes in Tav. And the emphasis falls on that which is set apart, holy, the white there, the Ola, the burnt offering, and the Shlamim, 
The peace offering is set apart, it's holy. If you think about a uh, peace offering, what can you think about? What is what is what comes to mind in terms of Islamim? Example. What is an example of a peace offering? There's one around the corner, Pesach. Pesach is Islamim. So it is set apart. But the difference is the mincha, the meal offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering is Kodesh Kodeshim. It is most holy. It is, it is like the Holy of Holies. So there's a difference. There is what is set apart and what is most set apart. It's what's holy and most holy. Holy of Holies. So the children of Israel had a way to approach the Father. And they could take the Slamim. What did they do with, uh, when the temple was standing in, in Israel, when it, the tabernacle was standing in Shiloh? What did they do with a, with a lamb that was slaughtered for Pesach? What happened? They took the lamb to the temple. The lamb was slaughtered and the blood of the lamb was splattered against the altar. And what did they do with the meat of the lamb? They took it home to consume it with their families. Something that is, that is holy of holies, that is most set apart, cannot be taken out of the temple courts again. Once entered, it remains. But if it's holy, it's not a lower order of worship. It just means that I can take it out and I can... It's an act of worship at home, that I can share the meal with the family. So, but if you bring a mincha, a chetat, and a asham, it remains in the temple forever. This is most holy, holy of holies. This is the closest that the Israelite can get to the presence of the Father. As the holy of holies is for the, the high priest in the holy of holies, in the Kodesh Kodeshim, likewise this is... The bronze altar where these sacrifices are brought, that is where I can see the face of the Father as a normal Israelite. Okay, so. That's very interesting. I've got a different presentation there and there. That's interesting. Let me just see. I've got a. Life is about communication. Have you discovered that? And nothing is communicating here at the moment. Let me just try to repair that. Ah. Baruch Hashem. So we've got wood for fire and our relationship is back online. So where does the, the sacrifices, where is the, the, the energy, where does, what, what facilitates our relationship, our sacrifices that we bring? Fire. Fire facilitates our relationship. So if you look at the character of a shin, the Hebrew character shin, it's looking like, it looks like a flame. It says that this is what's spiritual and it helps us to live a life before our Father and worship Him. So, wood is the product of the life and the death of a tree. So what, what starts, it starts out with a seed in the ground. The air and the sunlight and the water helps the tree to grow into maturity. And then at some stage it's cut off and it's used for wood for fire. All right, that is, that is where what helps us to facilitate our worship on the altar. And um, if you think about this, the Torah is the tree of life in Proverbs 3.18. So what helps us to facilitate our worship? What helps us to be successful in what, as we are pursuing our Father? We are walking in the ways of Scripture, we are walking in the ways of the Torah, and that helps the fire on the hearts of on the altar of our hearts to stay alight because we focus on him on everything that we say and everything that we do and where we walk we are focused on the father and we give thanks for what he provides in our life the torah is the tree of life and if the tree of life helps us and causes the the heat the the flames on the altar of our hearts that helps us to consume the mincha the ola the shlamim the chata, the, all the different sacrifices in our life comes from our relationship with our Father. Who is the living Torah then? Messiah compared himself to a tree in, in uh, Luke 23, 31. So, and if we think about the life of Messiah, we said what happens to a tree, a tree is planted in the ground, it is raised up through exposure by air and sunlight and water 
and as it grows into maturity, eventually it's cut off to facilitate worship. Essentially, this is what happened to Messiah. Is, um, Isaiah 53 says, Because of the covenant that's made with him, many will become righteous. Many people will follow him with everything. And this is why Messiah was living on the earth, is that, that in him we can be set into a position, in a relational position with our Father through covenant, to follow him and to worship our Father. So, if we follow Messiah, and this is the only possible way that we can be in a relationship with our Father, is through a relationship with Messiah. So if we follow Him and the wood of the altar, the, the provision, that what He gives to us and that what He provides for us for worship, is continually replenished on, the, on our hearts, we will have a life before our Father until forever. But if we walk away from Messiah, if we turn our backs on Him and we walk away from Messiah, the relationship will stop. The relationship will stagnate. So... It is our responsibility as worshippers to remove the ashes of yesterday's, of yesterday's sacrifice every day from our hearts and to put new wood on the altar and to bring the sacrifice of our lives so that our lives can be consumed to the glory of our Father and He can smell the sacrifice that we bring. And that will be our worship. So the word... The word, I just thought, let's just have a look. The word for, for tree. What is the word for tree? It's. And it's really, uh, if you think about it, they say it is a yod and uh, a zayin and a yod that forms the letter ayin. Mariki desem way ayin dai. Denken ni sone. Huh? And the tzadi. That's the word it's. That is, that is um, the word for tree. And um, it's two characters that is a, per, a, per, a parent root. It's a two-letter root that spells a couple of words. Um, it spells a word, if you add a yod, let's just write it out. If you add a yod with a ayin and a tzadi, what does it become? What is that word? Who knows? Is Ya'atz. And Ya'atz means? I think it means council. Yes, I think it's council. If you take this word, the same word, I think you're going to lose me here. I'm going too low. Uh, tzadi. And you add a mem at the end. Became, becomes one of two words. The first word is etsem. And it means the bones of your body. That's what's inside. What is the connection? It brings strength to my body. It is the strong part of my body that brings backbone to me so that I can stand firm like a strong tree. Okay? So the, the plural of a tree is etim, and the wood for the altar is etim as well. So it is, all of that says that, well, by the way, what I left out is this yod, what is a, what is it? no, this is a zayin. What is a zayin? What does it stand for symbolically? Who knows? A weapon, yes, a sword, a weapon. So the tzadi, uh, the zayin is a weapon, and this is an inverted yod. So the one is a weapon. Don't want to fall down. Weapon. And the following is a... Um, is a yod that says, that's the only character that hangs above the baseline, and it's the word that shows the, the ruach, the spirit. So this is supposed to be the spirit. So if you take a combination of this letter, it says, it speaks about the weapon, the weapons of our warfare, and it's spiritual. And what about the tzadi? What is the tzadi? If you look at the symbolic or the pictographic way it's presented, it is a man on its side. So, the tzadi also is the basis, the root word for the word tzaddik, the righteous one. So, so who is the, through Messiah, if we think about the reality of Messiah, if we worship him in spirit and in truth, because the word is the weapon of our warfare, 
and we follow the one who is the righteous one, then we will be in a very good place to worship him. Okay, so this is, the word it's is the, is the basis, the format for the way we are functioning. If we, don't have, um, if we don't have a backbone, if we don't have bones in our body, we won't be able to function. If we don't have the mighty and the strong trees which we can look at, that can be used for wood, we won't be able to worship. And in these physical pictures, it paints a spiritual picture on how we follow the Father. So it is important for us to know that we are worshipping our Father in spirit and in truth, and we are following the one who is righteous, Messiah. The Etz, the tree, the living Torah, the one that is revealed for us from eternity. So, how do we do it? How do we, how do we follow Him? How do we worship Him every day? As our, the fuel of this word is placed on the altar of our hearts, through prayer and praise and study and acts of righteousness, following and in acts of loving kindness, serving one another. This is the way that our relationship with the Father is kept alive. You agree? Is there anything else that we can that we can associate with this? You know, other ideas. How do you add fuel to the fire of your relationship with the Father? I think it is a, a life of dedication. Through, remember we spoke some time ago. We spoke about the reality of the of the korban tamid, the daily sacrifice. In the mornings, the sacrifice is brought. Yesterday, last night, is cleansed out. The priest that served through the night cleanses out the altar. It brings out the lamb of the morning. Through the day, the worship goes on. And tonight, it's closed off with another sacrifice. Every day of the week. Seven days a week. And this is the way that we are following the Father. Every day, seven days a week. I recently learned a, quite, a, quite a substantial truth. If you go to the gym, who's ever gone to the gym? <clears throat> and if you do so once, and you spend two hours there with lots of energy and so forth, what will happen the next day? Will you look nice and strong and firm and all good? You'll see no difference. All that will happen is you're going to experience severe pain. That's just about what. What if you go to the gym the next two days later and you do the same? What will be, what will be the, the change in your physical appearance? Probably nothing. The pain will just increase. But what will happen if you, if you go to the gym every day and don't overexert yourself, but you do exercises every day for three months? I mean, what will happen after three months? You will start to see a difference. Definitely. And this is the same with our spiritual lives. Our spiritual lives is not about what we do today and what we do tomorrow, but it is a, it's a commitment, it is a constant worship that we do over the course of our lifetime. And as we do so every day, committed and, and um, our lives before the Father, we will see a difference in our lives. And we should every Pesach, it's a good check, as we are preparing our hearts for Pesach, think about where you were last year this time. Are we... Have we progressed in our relationship with the Father? Is there anything in your life that, um, that you battled with last year that's still there? Anger and all of these little things? Is it still there or have you sorted it out in this last year? Or is our relationship standing still in terms of... You know, we are saying that we are being sanctified, isn't it? We are being sanctified by following the Father through the application of the Word in our lives then we cannot sit with the same problems this year that we sat with last year. Otherwise, it's just simply not true. So, it's a little bit of a challenge for each one of us because I'm looking at my own life and I'm realizing that, this, that some of the same things that I battled with last year, I'm still sitting with this year. So, it's a wake-up call. You know, It's like a New Year's resolution. This year, I'm going to lose 10 kilograms. June, I'm almost there, but I'm still needing to do 15. You know, because I'm going in the wrong direction. So, a fire needs a couple of things to, to function in your life. It needs air. It needs ruach. 
to function. You can have the best wood in the country, you can have flames, you can have everything, but you haven't got the ruach in your life, the flame in the altar of your heart is going to die. That's what it is. So, a fire needs air. And if there is wood, and there is, there is um, a flame of fire, which the, which the Father ignited when we got into a covenantal relationship, and there is there's, there's fire, air, and, and material to burn, then heat will be generated in your life. Have you, have you experienced that uh, something that burns emanates an odor? Something that is put on, in a cooking pot in the, on a stove, there is a nice smell usually coming from that. But if you take that same, that same um, roast that's now smelling so, so nicely, if you freeze it and you put it and you take it out of the, the fridge, what does it smell like? Zip. If your relationship with the Father is cold, there's no smell coming from your life. But if you ignite the, the fire on the altar of your heart and, and it can breathe the Spirit, the Spirit that the Father provides, and, and uh, you bring yourself, then it becomes an odor that the Father can, ex can experience and enjoy. Which led me to a very familiar scripture, Isaiah 11. It says, He shall come forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse, and a branch out of his root shall bear fruit, speaking about Messiah. And the spirit of Adonai shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, and Etza, and Chavura, and what's it, Yada, and Yerei Adonai. Those things will function in Yeshua's life. And his delight shall be in the fear of Adonai, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither the sight of the hearing of his ears. And if you look at those words, it's interesting, because the de and his delight, what is his delight? His delight is this word here. It is Vaharechu. Uh, Vaharechu. And it comes from, it comes from a, a, a word that is to smell. It says the smell of him, the scent of him, will cause him great pleasure. This is the scent of him in the fear of Adonai will bring him great pleasure. So if you try to bring this out a little bit, it says, and Messiah's delight, his delight, he smell with satisfaction shall be in the, in the awesome display of who our Father is. And two things, he will not judge by the sight of his eyes nor the hearing of his ears. Okay, so how do Messiah perceive, how does, he, how does the Father experience us pre uh, predominantly? We need to think about this. Thinking of, the, of which, how do we function? If you think about a work of art, give it, what, what examples of art is then the, that you can think of? Let's think of a couple. Work of art, examples. Paintings, yes, there is a couple of prominent paintings in, in the lifetime of a couple hundred years behind us, and um, I don't know art at all, so I can't even give any examples, but what about other type of things? Uh, music, what about uh, beautiful symphony, orchestra, music? That's art. What, are, what, uh, what other types of art are there? Sculptures. What's that? Dance. Yes. But what about other things that we perceive to be of great beauty? Even in nature. You know, a sunrise or a waterfall or the ocean or the beautiful mountains and all of those things what we perceive to be things that are special and beautiful and things that's to be enjoyed. So, what does that all have in common? How do we experience what we enjoy? Typically, through our eyes, and through our ears, and through touch. Mostly. This is, this is what it is. What's it, Tanerina? And emotional. That, that causes, the things that we experience around us, causes an emotional experience. It causes us to enjoy it. But mainly it is our visual and auditory senses that's involved. If you sit down in a play to experience something that someone else presents before you, it is sight and hearing. If you look at the, the nature, it's typically that. So, 
How do you Yeshua? How does Yeshua perceive us? Our Father. How does He perceive us? How does He do it? What does the Word say? He typically remember this. Let me just take you back one slide, two slides. This. It says, "And His delight, His smell with satisfaction, shall be in the fear of Adonai, and He shall not judge after the sight of His eyes, neither decide on the hearing of His ears." Those are the things that we are strong in. But that's not what he relies on. What he relies on is discernment, the smell of your life, the smell of your heart. And we normally have the idea that we are, our lives should smell, have a beautiful smell that, that just flows out of you. That if you walk into a, into a building and you start speaking and interacting with someone, what is the smell that should come from your life? The smell of Messiah. It is the smell that burns on the altar of your heart. It is what you bring as a sacrifice for the Father so that life and light will come from your life. Unfortunately, what sometimes happens is there are things that creeps in that is taking away some of that testimony. Some of the things that we're carrying on from last year and the year before and a couple of years that we've been carrying like a dead man, a corpse that we're dragging behind us. And sometimes as we engage in the discussions and things become a little bit heated, and you know, I, I don't even want to think about what the smell should be if you put a little couple of flames beneath a corpse. But those, uh, that can easily be the smell that our lives bring if we're in a pressure. So that's why it's important for us to deal with yesterday's stuff and to dwell in, the, in today in our worship with our Father. So, if you think about, I didn't want to put that up, but there's one, there's one central thing that's important for the Father in, in every one of the sacrifices that we've discussed. What is the one central thing that our Father deems to be very important in the sacrifices? Okay, if the fat burns, the kidney and the fat burns, what is, what is, how does the Father experience it? The sweet aroma is pleasing. And um, the first, the rule of first occurrence in Scripture, if you look at the first occurrence of this, it's, it is, I thought it's going to be Abel and Cain's, or Abel's sacrifice, but it wasn't. The first time that, um, that this is mentioned, Let's read it together. And Noah built an altar to Adonai. And he took, of, he took of every clean beast and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Adonai smelled a soothing fragrance. He smelled a soothing fragrance. And he said in his heart, because of what he smelled, the attitude that was in, in Noah's heart was carried over into the sacrifice. And then what was presented before the Father, that's what the Father smelt. And He said in His heart, Never again shall I curse the ground because of man. Although the inclination of man's heart is evil from his youth, and never again shall I smite all creatures as I have done. From this sacrifice and this act of worship that one man brought, this was the result. If you, oops, sorry, if you look at the word that's used, it says, Vareach, it says, and he is smelling. Who is smelling? Our father is smelling the smell of the. This is the this is the thing. It is it's chaniochach. Chaniochach. It's the word. I don't know if there's a word sounding like that. Close enough. My wife actually says it's a honeybee. Chaniochach. <clears throat> it's a honeychocha. You know, but I don't think that's the typical way of in, in, interpreting Hebrew. But it's close enough. So, what is the root word, the root of that word? The root of that word is Noach. The root of the, of the sweet smelling fragrance that our father experienced is in honor of a man. A man who lived righteously in his generations. And that's where it begins. As if we bring our, our um, act of worship in, a, in humbleness, after spending time in tribulation. Remember, it was a little bit of a difficult riot that Noah had in the, in the ark. 
And you bring it from a heart of adoration and worship for what who our Father is. And you bring off your resources. Any farmers will know that you don't typically burn your, the stock that you are going to breed with. You know, it's not a good practice. This is what Noah did. To bring off the livestock that he brought with him on the ark. In honor of who our Father is. And the Father honored him. And he said the restful fragrance that comes up in his being is in honor of the man called Noah. If you work through Leviticus, 16 times it is repeated. It says, And an offering made by fire is a sweet savor unto Adonai. An offering made by fire is a sweet savor. 16 times. Nine, uh, 16 times over the, over the whole of Leviticus. Vayikra. This is the one thing that's the common denominator between all the sacrifices. A, sacrif a korban, a sacrifice, is successful and acceptable before the Lord, before our Father, when it is a sweet aroma, a sweet savor that He can experience. And He says, what I'm smelling is reflected in the hearts of those who bring it. So, remember in Jeremiah, if I got it here, I don't know. In Jeremiah it says that, our Father said, your, your sacrifices and your worship is unacceptable to me. I hate it. But these are the things that he loved in, in Vaikra. What changed? The attitude and the heart's expression of the people that worship changed. So, of, so uh, a friend of mine asked me, what is it about liver and uh, what is it about kidneys and fat that the father likes? Because it says, it repeats it over and over. It's a sweet aroma before him. But it's nothing to do with the physical smell. It is to do with the attitude of the worshipper, the heart of the worshipper. So, if we think about the, the value that this brings, of uh, this, the fragrance of sacrifice, let me just read you that portion in Jeremiah that speaks about a, when our attitude is not right. It says, Jeremiah 6.19, it says, Listen, I'm about to bring calamity on this people, on the fruit of their plans, because they didn't listen to my words and they rejected my instruction. What good is frankincense that comes from Sheba to me? Or what good is sweet cane from a distant country? Your burnt offerings aren't acceptable, nor are your sacrifices pleasing to me. Remember, it's repeated over and over that it's the sweet sacrifice, the sweet aroma is pleasing to our Father. It says in Jeremiah, nor are your sacrifices pleasing to me. So, how, do we, how did they get from a place where the father, the worship that was brought to him was a sweet aroma to I hate it. It is because in their hearts you don't remove yesterday's sacrifice and it clogs up. And at the end you're thinking a heap of ashes is what worship looks like. But it's not that. It is a well-maintained altar that is lit. The fire can never die because the fire was lit by the father initially when you came into a covenantal relationship with him. And you maintain that fire at all cost and, you rem and respectfully remove in, with a good memory of what happened yesterday in your relationship with the Father and you're looking forward to our experience and the re reality of our relationship today. That's how we go forward. So, 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, Believers, we are a sweet savor unto Messiah, the sweet savor of Messiah to the Father. 1 Peter 2.5 says, Compared to the living stones that are being built in the spiritual house, that is to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So why are we called uh, living stones in the house of the Father? For a purpose. To offer up sweet sacrifices. To offer up sacrifices that has got a sweet smell before the Father. So Romans 12.1 says that um, our... Our, act, our acceptable act of worship is to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And if we do so with the right attitude, then it will be a sweet aroma before our Father. Hebrews 13.5 says, It comes through a sacrifice of praise, which can be misunderstood to say, I don't really feel like worshiping today. I don't feel like praising today. But I will commit my life and I will press through and I will do this a hundred times until I feel ready to praise and then 
This we are brought, that was a sacrifice of praise. But a, a sacrifice, anything that we bring to come close to the Father with a wrong attitude is not acceptable to Him. We saw that in Jeremiah. He says He hates it. So, the praise that we bring, the sacrifice, remember the root word for sacrifice or the, the Hebrew word for sacrifice is a korban. It comes from karav. It says, to draw near, to come close to me. So how do, we, how do we worship our Father and how do we come close to Him? Through praise, through prayer, through study, through acts of loving kindness towards one another, to glorify His name. That's how we come close. So, our Father is making us into, a, into to be a perfect in every good work, to do His will, to work according to which is well-pleasing in His sight through Yeshua, our Messiah, Hebrews 13 says. That is how we become a sweet aroma before Him. 2 Corinthians 2 says, Paul says, For us to spread the fragrance of the knowledge of Yeshua everywhere, we are the aroma of Messiah unto our Father among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Unfortunately, to some the fragrance will be from death to death, and the other it will be a fragrance from life to life. It remains the choice of the one that we are in relationship with. But we should bring the, the fragrance of, 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 of Messiah. A wonderful fragrance that can show love and mercy and grace and compassion and all of those things so that our, can, we can glorify our Father in the presence of other people. If they accept, accept it, it will be from life to life. If they reject our testimony, it will be from death to death in their lives. But our responsibility is to bring the fragrance of Messiah. So what is it that we do proclaim? It says that um, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, says that, let's just search for it because I can't remember what it says. What does Ephesians 2 say? Ephesians 2. Ephesians is in the New Testament, for those who wonder. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10. Now get my glasses, I wouldn't have to guess what it says. For by such grace you've been saved through faith. This didn't come from you, but it is the gift of Adonai. So remember, if we are following, walking in the ways of Torah, we are not saved through the works of Torah, because it was never designed for that. We are always saved through what Messiah has done. And it's not a result of actions, because that will put a stop to all boasting. For we are our Father's masterpiece, created in Messiah Yeshua to perform good actions, that our Father prepared long ago to be our way of life. So what is the good actions that our Father has prepared for us way before? It is so that our hearts can be inclined towards Him, to do works of loving kindness towards one another, to follow Him with everything that we do, to walk in the ways that He has set apart in His character in the Torah. That is how we do it. This is, if we are proclaiming the good news of Messiah, and living the, the news of the gospel to each one within the framework of Torah, I think we are in a very good place, and we are in a place that we can emanate the aroma of Messiah. So, do you know what the word for witness is in Greek? What is the word for witness in Greek? Who knows? It is an unexpected word. It is the word martur. You know what that is? It is the word martyr. So, so who is witnesses here for Messiah? Nobody? We are all witnesses for Messiah. Do you know the people that, that died in the Colosseum and all the other places, the nasty places that the Romans could think of? They carried the witness to the end. They carried their witness to the point of death. And then they became martyrs. But we associate the word martyr, that portion, and to the end. But it's the willingness, it is the attitude of your heart that, that proclaims and acknowledges our Father's being your everything. So that you become willing to acknowledge Him right until the end. You don't become a martyr that last hour of your life. You're a martyr from now on to the last 
out of your life. And if we can get that mindset in our lives, it won't be a surprise for you when you get to a point of difficulty. You know? So, if we can think about this again, we are witnesses of the knowledge that Yeshua reconciled us to our Father forever. So, who are the guys that is beneath the throne in heaven? They are the witnesses. They are the witnesses of His goodness and His glory through all ages in a point of difficulty when they went through tribulation. There will one day be a great tribulation that we know. We are thinking as will come in, in, time, in the days to come sometime. But in every generation there was tribulation. Right from the very beginning. Matthew 24, the first 35 verses, it's all about the tribulation that they experienced in the time of Jeru the destruction of Jerusalem. They experienced this. And through, uh, uh, one, uh, Revelations 1.3 says, Who are blessed by the book of Revelations? Those that read it aloud. Those that hear it. And those that do it. How can we, if we haven't got no sound. <clears throat> how can we... How can we Obey and do the words of Revelation, the book of Revelation, 2,000 years ago. How can we do those words in today's life before the events of Revelation starts to unfold? In every generation, tribulation comes and goes as my experience from time to time. life through all ages and to remember what James said quite some time ago he said um, we can we can make the choice either we look to a time of the apocalypse that we're looking at all the uh, these unfolding events and try to apply them to the book of, Re of revelation or we can walk in an attitude where messiah is revealed in our lives every day because that's what revelations that's what apocalypse means is the revelation of Messiah in your life and my life as we live our normal lives every day. So what does the aroma of our hearts look like, of our lives? John 15, 13 says, Greater love is no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Are we called to lay down our lives for our friends? It's a strong word. But what does it mean to lay down your life for your friends? We are serving one another in an attitude of humbleness and meekness so that we can help another person if he is battling in his reconciliation with the Father to equip him in that area of his life so that he can stand and he's, the altar of his heart will be functioning. Think about Messiah's life. Isaiah 53 says, It was the will of his Father to crush him. It was... Uh, it's a tough story. It was the will of our father to crush his son. Now what I get to understand is that the whole framework, everything that we see in scripture, we can find in the existence of the temple. So this is something that I want to focus on in my life, is to understand the function and the construction and all of the actions within the temple better, because I think we will understand our spiritual lives better. Because as the, temp the tabernacle and the temples in the past have functioned and showed us examples, we know that there will be a temple in the millennium to come to help us to facilitate worship as it goes. But what about the temple in the, the Akhremot, the, the days in the eternity? The temple disappear. No more temple in the Re Revelation 22. Messiah is the temple. So if we want to learn everything about Messiah and His character, look at the temples, the tabernacle, and everything that existed to equip our lives to be transformed into the image of the Son, who is the temple. So, if it is the will of our Father to crush Messiah, it is because He presented Himself as incense, facilitating worship, bringing others closer to Him. And remember, it, was, it wasn't done begrudgingly. He gave up His life willingly. Because he knew, remember what uh, Hebrews 12 says? It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of Elohim. 
Because he knew what Isaiah 53 said. It's because through his sacrifice, through him causing the heat of tribulation, whatever beneath him that caused this aroma before the Father, will bring thousands and millions of people close to the Lord. So how does it work for our lives? Are we presenting our lives for tribulation, for difficulty? And how do we, how do we respond? How do we do it when we're there? What are we burning? A rose? Do we smell like a rose? Or not so much? You know? It's a challenge for all of us. But we should grow into producing the aroma of Messiah in every situation. That's what we're called for. We are not called for having an academic study of the Word and knowing it by heart. That's important and we need to do it. But if He doesn't change our lives and our hearts and that's what we are battling with every year, it's pointless. You know why you don't write with a broken pencil? Because it's pointless. <laughs> so, if we... If the word is written on our hearts every day as we go forward, but we don't live the attitude that the Father wants, if we are not transformed into the image of the Son through our attitude and our actions, that's pointless too. So, it's a challenge for us. We are sitting at the season of redemption. When the moon is full again, we're there. This is a time that we can do some soul searching. And be honest with ourselves and say, Father, I'm battling with this in my life. Help me in this season to change it so that I can be transformed. Because I realize I have been conformed to the pattern of the world. If I get into tribulation, this is how I'll respond. Help me to be transformed to get rid of that corpse in my life. So... Messiah's uh, sacrifice gave off the sweetest fragrance, like the fragrance in the temple. The frankincense, the myrrh, the galbanum, all the things that the Father, the five species that He brought together, act of mercy, to burn before Him as, so that we can have communication with Him. Messiah's life was representing that for us. Isaiah 53.11 says, His death made many to be accounted for uh, as righteous. His followers are called to live out every form of goodness. That is, if you combine Ephesians 5, 2 and 9, it says, we, His followers, are called to live out every form of goodness and righteousness and truth in His presence. This is who we should be. You know? Keeping Shabbat is very important. Eating in the lifestyle that we see in Leviticus is very important. Maintaining the feasts are very important. The things that we are honoring for the, for the Torah are very important because it helps us to shape our lives to live the character of the Father. Because that's what's shown to us. But those are not the things that we are going to be judged upon. What we are judged upon is the attitude of our hearts. That's more important. So... We are called to demonstrate Messiah's suffering and sacrifice. However it looks in every one of our lives. Every, every life we've got different challenges. We have different challenges in different ways in different areas of our life. But we are called to live out those things. And in those days when it's difficult, have an aroma of peace. You know? Lynn said this morning, may you experience peace and light. Is that the things that we are showing to each other in our lives when things are not going so well? You know? So, so I, my prayer is for us as a family that we will have a proper, the correct, the right fragrance of Messiah in our lives as we are heading towards days that are going to become more difficult. So that we will not look to our own ways and means to deal with problems but that we will lay our lives down before the Father and to, so that His light and His fragrance will be shown through us. So, I think it's getting late. Let me just run through this quickly. If we look at the aroma of your prayers, there are three main areas in our lives that, that's, that is giving off an aroma. It's the aroma of our witness that we just spoke about, 
What do we do among believers in the world? It is a witness to the rest of who our Father is. And there we must have the witness and the aroma of our Father that flows through our life. But if we are coming forward to, uh, if we are walking with our Father in prayer, as the, as the, um, in, the frankincense and all the, the, um, the incense has got a formula in the temple, there is a formula that the Father, there are certain suggestions what our prayer life should look like. And if we have prayers of thanksgiving and prayers of forgiving one another and asking for forgiveness and interceding for one another, those are the things that's building a community and showing the love and the grace and the mercy of the Father and changing our hearts as believers. So those are the aroma that, fr that will come from your prayer life if our prayer life is not so much self-centered in terms of give me what I need and do this for me, and so forth. If you are looking outward for the benefit of the community, then a better fragrance will come from our prayer lives. Ephesians says, Walk in love as Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us. A gift and an offering for Elohim as a sweet-smelling fragrance. Are we called to be disciples? What is a disciple of Messiah? What, is it, what does it mean to be a disciple? How will we act? Probably like he act. This is what a Talmud is. You walk behind, you walk behind the, your master. You follow him in everything that he do. You eat like he eat. You speak like he spoke. You do everything. You emanate him with... If he leaves and people see you, they will think you are him. So, this is why the writer of Ephesians said, look at the example that Messiah had. So, because of his example, walk in love as Messiah loved us and gave himself for us. A gift and a korban, an offering to our Father. And that will be a sweet-smelling fragrance. So, the life of a believer is not always moonlight and roses. It is a life of self-sacrifice to the benefit of the community. So, last slide. It says, 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, But thanks be to Elohim who always leads us on to overcome in Messiah and manifests through us the fragrance of the knowledge in every place. Because we are to Elohim the fragrance of Messiah among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death to death and the other one the fragrance of life to life. So my prayer is in these days when, um, when the, li the whole world is in turmoil and our lives are under pressure and everything else is honky-dory. We will have the fragrance of life, the fragrance of Messiah in our lives as we prepare ourselves for Pesach as around the corner. Because remember what Paul said is that if we come to that Korban Shlamim, the Pesach, and we have attitudes, we have problems in our lives with brothers and sisters and this and that, leave that behind and sort it out first. Because if we eat of the Korban Shlamim in an unworthy way, it is detrimental to your health. Okay. Is there any comments here? Anyone wants to say something or ask something? I wonder. I wonder where we are at, really. You know, we come together and we study the Torah and we develop as a family and, and it's good and we are walking in unity. Everything is good. And I think our experience as a family is very good and it's a it's for me, it's a pleasure and an and a, um, honor to be part of this family. But the Father has given us a responsibility. He's given us the Torah, He's given us His Word, and He's given us His Ruach, and He's given us the ability to follow Him and to walk after Him and to grow in maturity so that when, things are, when it's really needed, that we can be the fragrance of Messiah. And, um, and I can see sometimes when things are difficult that we are missing it you know we turn inwards to self-preservation and to this and that rather than to live a life 
that is bringing the fragrance of Messiah into the world. So, hopefully, and by faith, the Father will lead us in all understanding and in wisdom, as uh, Lynn read this morning, Proverbs 2 is about wisdom. So, <clears throat> let us follow the Father and develop in wisdom, His wisdom, not our wisdom, so that we can develop into a community that shines the light of Messiah, that emanates a fragrance that is acceptable and wonderful for our Father every day, and that will draw men unto our Father so that they can glorify Him. So, Father, that's our prayer for this day, is that as we are looking at the Korbanot in, uh, in Vaikra, in, in Leviticus, Father, it is wonderful that you are showing us the things that is important to you, but I realize also it gives us in the responsibility. It shows and it, it, pro it brings us to a place where we are confronted with the idea of what about our offering? What is the attitude of our hearts when we bring something to you in worship? Is it our will that needs to be done? Or are we relying on your will? Father, help us in this time that's ahead. Help us in these days that as we're preparing our lives and our hearts for the time of Pesach that's around the corner, help us to be honest with ourselves. Help us in these days to see the attitudes of our heart and how other people perceive us so we can rectify the things in our lives that's maybe not on track. I pray for every brother and sister that's sitting here, Father, that your spirit will speak to us in these days and that our hearts will be humble and that our hearts will be pliable and that the seed of your word and your ruach will not fall on dry or dusty or rocky soil, but that our hearts will be prepared and fruit-bearing, fruit Father, deep, wonderful soil so that your word can, can penetrate our hearts and can bear much fruit. Thank you for the examples that you've given us in Scripture. Thank you for Messiah. Thank you that you've equipped us with your word and has given us your spirit and put the flame of covenant, your flame of your presence in our hearts as the altar. Help us, Father, to maintain the altar so that you'll be a life to your glory. I praise you, Father, and I honor you. Amen.